Hello and welcome to Navani Milorian Theory Video. I'm Shergok, your host, and today we are going to take a closer look at something incredible. Namely, at three times where Ein Solgon was as smart and ingenious as he pretended to be. But before we're going to take a closer look at any of this, let me quickly thank my Patreons for supporting this channel, as well as say thanks to all users of the YouTube Thanks function for making one-time donations. And with that said, let's get to the topic at hand. It's well known that Ein Solgon, the overlord of the Great Tomb of Nazareth and leader of the 41 guild members, isn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed. And often not even in the shed at all. And he's rarely aware of what's actually happening around him. And all of this isn't just an exaggeration. It was a very, very, very real thing indeed. For starters, Einzelgon took over seven books to even remotely realize that the Great Tomb of Nazareth was planning world domination and world conquest. Something akin to what the Pinky and the Brain attempt multiple times in just one episode. Eins had no clue until the seventh book. Like, imagine Harry Potter only discovering magic existing in the seventh book of the entire series. Or Jon Snow realizing in the seventh season of Game of Thrones that he is actually a Targaryen. You know what, never mind. Moreover, Eins has consistently been out of touch with what's happening around him. For example, he simply wanted to fight in the Imperial Arena, in the capital city of the Empire, Arvintar. But his... let's call it complete ignorance of diplomatic protocols and customs meant that Jerknif never learned about this visit of another king and that he was very, very surprised when Ein Solgon was indeed fighting in the Imperial Arena of Aventar. And this led Jerknif to conclude that Eins was pursuing a highly integrated plan to sabotage him and his budding alliance, leaving him with no choice but to surrender and offering his empire as a vassal state to avoid the wrath of the undead king. And it has become a meme by now that Einzelgon still doesn't know what exactly happens on the happy farm. And who's not entirely happy to be there at all. And privately Eins was far from well educated, while in his world he was relatively speaking well educated, in the harsh and dystopian future of the year 2138 this merely meant that he had completed his basic education and his mother had literally worked herself to death to finance it. In other words, Eins had little classical education and was thus mentally unequipped to keep up with someone like Demiurge, who was blessed with all sorts of demonic knowledge and wisdom. Because Demiurge is not only intelligent, but was also granted an enormous wealth of knowledge by his creator, Ulbert Elaine Oddle. Nevertheless, there were three very memorable moments where Ein Solgon did indeed display the diabolically brilliant overlord type of intelligence he often merely pretends he has. And the first moment I want to highlight is when Eins held a typical conversation you'd expect from a ruthless undead overlord. When Kokudus and Eins Ulgon were on their way to the hot spring, the one that Nazareth had on the ninth floor, they discussed the topic of shelter and revenge. Revenge for the fact that the Blood Red Valkyrie had been attacked and mind controlled by an as yet unknown enemy, forcing Eins to fight against one of the beloved NPCs of the Great Tomb, whom he considered as the children of his very dear friends. And Cocutus agreed and thought of the saying, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which today seems like a brutal form of revenge and retribution, harming someone in exactly the same way they harmed you, like taking their eye if you lost yours due to their attack. But Eins was, at first at least, surprisingly against this, not because he found this form of revenge to be too brutal, 
but because he found it to be quite the opposite, because Eins knew that this form of justice originally existed to establish equality between the attacker and the victim, and showing that everyone, no matter their status and the position in society, had formally the same rights under the law, at least on paper. It ensured that even the lowest ranking citizen in theory could seek retribution for an injury in the same way as the highest ranking citizen, and that their body parts and their life are of equal value. And this type of justice also had a second fundamental component. It served to limit excessive revenge. If someone lost their eye, they could only take the eye of the offender in return. They couldn't, in addition to all of this, break every bone in their body, or take another form of additional revenge. In other words, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, was meant to limit excessive revenge. But Heinz didn't want that. He explained to Cocutus that he explicitly desired this excessive revenge, far beyond what had been done to Sheltier. And this was a real classic undead overlord moment that you would expect if Eins was basically, like if he didn't hear his inner thoughts and minds, if he appeared to us like an actual undead overlord, hell-bent on world domination. And again, when it comes to his NPCs, he is truly hell-bent on revenge. And it also shows that Eins had absorbed a significant amount of knowledge from Ulbert, Tabula Sparagdina, Punito Moe, and, of course, the other members of the Great Tomb of Nazareth. And next, we have Project Utopia. It's an incredibly ambitious plan that Eins Ulgon is pursuing, one so grand that not even Demiurge or Albedo can fully understand it. Because Eins truly wants to create a utopian state, a nation known for peace, wealth and prosperity, which would be the complete opposite of the poverty, misery and the dystopian world with no natural ecosystem that existed in the year 2138 and where he grew up. It's a complete counter-design to this. And in fact, this kingdom that he envisions was so peaceful and benevolent to its subjects, even those not from Nazareth, that Demiurge and Albedo can't even comprehend what Einzulgon is planning. Because both Demiurge and Albedo are convinced that all of this talk of existence and coexistence and kindness about removing fear from the other citizens of the great tomb of Nazareth on the sixth floor and in the wider sorcerer kingdom and showing that a peaceful coexistence with the NPCs of the great tomb of Nazareth is actually possible, even though they are undead, they are demons or other heteromorphic beings, was something they could not understand at all. For them, it was all just a trick to lull the world into a false sense of security, so that when the time came, Nazare could strike completely unprepared targets, dominating and brutally eliminating all enemies, namely all outsiders, with minimal losses. And the reason why Einzelgon wants to do all of this is equally incomprehensible to Demiurge and Albedo. Eins wants to improve the reputation of Einzelgon, the guild's name, that he has chosen for his own name by associating it with a peaceful and benevolent kingdom so that the other non-Nazarick denizens would think highly of it. And this wish that he had, that he also explained to Nea Baraya during the coach ride, was something Demiurge and Albedo found unimaginable. And the third and final moment is basically every single moment related to combat, strategy and tactics. Ein Sulgon has devised an extremely integrate, multi-layered and concealed plan, actually several plans, plans within plans, designed to draw out the enemy who attacked Sheltier from the shadows. First, Eins fought Sheltier alone to use himself as bait, with the intention of trapping the enemies that attacked her, using the world item depiction of nature and society, wielded by Aura way, way back, behind the lines of any ensuing battle, so he could capture them all at once, 
and this way they would not only gather the information from the suspected players who attacked Sheltie. For example, why they targeted Eins, the Great Tomb and Sheltie specifically, who sent them, how many they are, what items they possess, how strong they are, and where their guild base is. But he would also gain significant bargaining power and leverage over this enemy guild, if half of the enemy players from this enemy guild were already caught in this trap. Because the other guild's NPCs would naturally be willing to do anything to bring back their creators, and this would greatly strengthen Ein Sulgorn's hand in any upcoming negotiations. And the battle against Platinum Dragonlord was also brilliant. Eins didn't fight personally, he had Pandora's actor represent him and deliberately let Albedo be lured away and the entire battle was intended to be basically lost from the very start, not to be won. It was a learning moment, a moment for Pandora's actor to gather as much information as possible from the opponent and that's exactly what Pandora's actor did. And the NPC created by Einzel Gone went even further than Demiurge or Albedo ever thought was possible or appropriate by kneeling down and humbly begging for his own life in front of Platinum's armor. Something that was scandalous for Albedo and would probably only be considered by Ein's personal NPCs because, again, a bit of Ein's is inside Pandora's actor. And this pragmatic approach to the battle is something Eins had learned and internalized as a member of one of the top player killer guilds back in Yggdrasil Online. And this immense experience was also something Platinum lacked. Not only did Eins gather extensive information about Platinum's armor, magic and world items, but he also fed Platinum plenty of false information regarding his own strength and abilities. This misled Platinum to the point that he suspected Eins Olgon might actually be just another NPC and that Albedo was the actual player. And he also considered that Nezerik might have in fact two world items and this isn't entirely wrong. Nezerik can indeed use two world items, but it doesn't just have two, it has nine others as well. Still, Eins was cautious enough to say that he might have to lose another battle against Platinum, or rather against Riku Aganea, as the Dragonlord called himself, in order to be certain of how to defeat him on the third and final attempt without letting him escape. Eins also discovered that Platinum's armor was just an armor, a remote device controlled from the outside, something that Platinum failed to realize, since he had no idea that the Eins he fought was actually just a disguised and transformed Pandora's actor. In other words, in this case, Eins was truly the overlord, the brilliant tactician and strategist that he usually just pretends to be. His expertise in this battle and in this information warfare far surpassed that of Demiurge and Albedo, and was even completely incomprehensible to Pandora's actor. In other words, Eins Hulgon for once was truly the smartest person in the room when it comes to this type of warfare. And with that said, now it's your turn. What do you think of this video about the three moments where Einzelgon was actually smart and a brilliant tactician and strategist and this enigmatic and just overall hyper-intelligent overlord he pretends to be? And which other moments do you recognize where Einzelgon was truly clever and brilliant? Let me know it down in the comment section. And with that said, please check out my other channels and my AI channel if you don't like my accent but still want to know what is going on in the video. They are all linked down in the video description. And as usual, I say thank you very much for watching, thanks to all of my patrons for supporting this channel, and special thanks to Dash Dash Dash, Ada Daddy Ada, ASK, Bad Guy Ye, Bad Burrito 316, Bezer, Ben C, Brandon D, Chrissy, Crowley 0221, Sia, Crystal Prime, Dead Slime, Death is Mercy, 
Deathless Dragonlord, Demon Xenomorph 1987, Devin Downen, Ding Dong, Dan Pep, Dragonlord Placido Saxophone, Duckwagon, Dunkler Krieger, Dystopia, Dystopia the Second, Enigmatic Unicorn, Feral Shivan, Guy with Dead Head, Hector Marino, Hoss, Huster, Jacob G, Jana B, Jason, J. Morris, Chromius, Kyle R, Lee K. Long, Legendarius, Lelouch V. Bitania with a Mustache, Lexus Fox, Lord Nishikian Rai, Lord Touch Me, Lofraser, Merovec, Mr. Shoes, Mr. Tweaker, Michael R, Michael Y, Nope, Oh Hell No, Normal Toad, Oh Kill, Overlord General Gasper, Paddy Pantom, Personage, Ruru, Primus Eleven, Rhinomir, Kune Karakos P, Shergox's Daddy, Shadow Lightning Wolf, Shrine Keeper, Sir Axolotl, Super Tier Magic Batista Bomb, Supreme Cheese, Staris, Ted, Texas Deer, Diorg Warboss, Rocket Smasher, T. E. Wang, Vash Hawkeye, Vegito 27, Venture Fanatic, Wilhelm, Zinukai, and Sonagon. Thanks, guys. Anyway, have a nice day, and I hope to see you all again soon under my next video.